get you Royal Rangers. Just to have Royal Rangers is not enough. You've got to know how to teach it and what to teach. Now the little boys nowadays are living in their adverse, adverse conditions. A lot worse than what I had as a child. You probably thought I had a bad childhood from what little I've told you about me. That was just the tip of the iceberg. But our children nowadays are going through it. They're hurting. Because what they're seeing is how their parents live and how their parents act and walk and talk. Most of them, the only person that they see that they can look up to is a Royal Ranger leader or a missionette leader. I'll give you an example. Suge is a Ranger Kids commander, second, uh, kindergarten, first and second grade the little guys and that to me that's the most important grade group because it's a foundation I'm going to tell you just one incident but this happens this kind of thing happens all the time we had a grandmother bring a, a, a grandson in one night and he was crying he didn't want to do anything He crawled up in a chair, one with arms on it, in a fetal position. And that told me something right there. Now, Suge, this is the beginning of the meeting, and, and before, in Royal Rangers, before you start the meeting, boys will run and jump and whatnot. And to keep them settled down, you gotta give them something to do. So she had them all lined up on, a, on there were six boys line up on one side of the table and she, on the other where the authority is, the students over here on the other side of the table. And they were their little top, little tops they spin in. And she had them contest, see who could spin theirs the longest. And he was sitting over crying. His grandmother's trying to get him to quit crying. She walked over to me and said, his mother just kicked out a guy out of her house that was living with her and brought a new man in. And the new man was mean to, this little, to her grandson. He hurt him. You see the programming that took to that little boy? That's a standard that he goes by. When he grows up, that's, that's, that's the way you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to live together. for a while and then separate and live with somebody else. That's what his little computer was programmed. Shug left the boys doing this and she walked over to the grandma and said, we'll take care of him. She had already developed a relationship with that little boy. She called him a name, put her hand on him, And she says, would you help me tonight be my helper? Now, she already had a love type of relationship with that little boy. And he sniffled a little bit. And so he got to be on the side where the authority is. And he got to tell the other boys when to start the tops and who won. See, you see what she did? I tell a story a lot of times to my leaders and others that there was a, a, a rancher one time that wanted to improve his cattle herd. So he saved up 
money and bought a very expensive bull calf. And the bull calf was just outside the barn and a hailstorm was coming. And he got concerned that a hailstorm hail would hit that calf and kill it. And so he tried to get the calf in and he wouldn't do it. Just you pull it and go around and twist the tail. He couldn't make a calf move and he wanted so bad because he had a lot of money tied up in it. His little wife was at the kitchen window watching and she could care less about the dumb calf. She stepped on her porch and dried her hands on her apron and said, just a minute, honey. She walked out there and she petted it and talked to it real sweet, put her finger in his mouth and let him right in. She made a calf do what she wanted to do. Suge made that little boy do what she wanted to do. And I've seen my commanders use that trick many, many times. We had a little boy. He hadn't been uh, over Ranger Kids, but a lot older than Ranger Kids, but he came to Ranger Kids, and he was a problem child. He's been raised by his grandparents. Mother and dad divorced and abandoned him. And the grandparents, again, didn't know beans and buttonholes about it how to raise a child. They said in school that uh, he would tear the classroom up. They'd take him to the principal's office and he'd just tear the place up and they'd call the police to come get him. And he came in to the Grinch Kids meeting. And Suge, at that time, had a lot of little army men and then airplanes and whatnot for the kids that play, for the boys play with before the meeting started. He decided he wanted all of them. So he raked them all up. And Suge tried talking into sharing. He claimed that wouldn't say anything. And so she came and got me. I was in another cl classroom. And I went in and talked to him, and I called him a name. And I had developed a relationship with him. She had, too. And I said, well, the only thing we can do is take him to his grandpa. His great-grandpa said he is demon-possessed. The boy was not demon-possessed. He was not a problem child. He was a child with a problem. He didn't have a mother and daddy. He had a, a grandparents that didn't know how to train him. He was lashing out at society. The grandpa came in and started screaming at him. Physically picked him up and took him to the front door and called somebody to come get him. I went around there and I put my arm around the little boy and he snuggled up next to me, just, just melted right into me, my side. And I put my other arm on him. And I talked to him real sweet. I held him there for about 15 minutes until they got there. I called him a name when he left. I said, remember, I love you and Jesus loves you. What do you think that did to the boy? Now, he came to the Royal Ranger meetings two times in that year. Neither time was he involved in the great group that I was, so I didn't see him. But a year after that incident, we had a leadership training course overnight, Friday and Saturday. And he came. And he sat <laughs> he sat down in the back part of the gym and played this number and wouldn't mix it with the other boys. So I motioned to him to come over here and 
So I put my arm around, I called him my name, I said, I wonder if you wouldn't enjoy playing with the other boys. And said, by the way, I want you to know I love you, and guess what he said? And Jesus loves me. He said it a year earlier that he heard that. It was programmed on that computer within his ears. Now, that's, that's the Royal Rangers right there. And I've seen my leaders do that kind of thing many, many times. I've seen boys turned around simply because a godly man or a godly woman showed them love. Now, a bright spot. Back when I was a child, I got saved age 11. A few years later, my mother got saved. And when she died at 89 and a half, she knew the Bible better than most preachers do because she studied it. She lived it. My stepdad, a few years later, got saved. But he got hurt. And so many people in our churches get hurt nowadays. So he dropped out. And he wouldn't serve the Lord. He was a good man. He didn't drink, smoke. But he and I still had no father-son relationship. And mother and, dad, mother and him lived together over 60 years. Very, very ha happy. Now, the way he treated me, you would think that I could care less about him. Mother passed away, and he grieved hardly because they had such, such an outstanding relationship. They had a very good sexual life, and that's what makes it for a good marriage. And that's designed by God. That's his intentions. He had two daughters. No, one daughter and two granddaughters. 50 miles away in Houston. And he had bad knees. And he was going to get a knee replaced. And the doctor told him, he said, your heart won't take it. He said, I don't care. Mother's dead. I don't have anything left for her. I don't want to live in, I don't want to be in a wheelchair all, all my life. Now, for years, I would go in and talk to him about the Lord. And I said, you need to get back in church. You need to get your heart back to the Lord. And he'd say, he'd look at me with a cold eyes and say, I'm as good as those hypocrites down at that church. And he was. He was. I couldn't get him. I mean, for years I did that. Three or four times a year I'd go in and visit him. But when he went for them for that surgery, his daughter didn't even come down from Houston. His granddaughter didn't. Even, living right there in his house with him. Didn't didn't come to the hospital. The nurse came in and shaved his leg and put that, what we call monkey blood, iodine all over it. And when she went out, I took a chair and put it under the door handle. And I went back and I looked at him and I said, Dad, your doctor told you that you were not going to make it. He said, I don't care care I don't need I don't want to live if I can't have mother 
then I looked at him and I said, you need to get your, give your heart to the Lord. 